Welcome to the InnoQ Technology Lunch. Today, Ludwig Sundström will talk about functions, functors, and categories. Um, you can always ask questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, we will have time to answer them after the talk. Um, I hope you will enjoy the talk, and now I give the word to Ludwig. So, hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Ludwig Sundström. I'm a consultant with InnoQ for about a year now. But in the not too distant past, I was a university student and I used to sit in um, big rooms like this. This is a big uh, university library uh, with a lot of people, everyone just doing their own thing. And I did a classical computer science um, uh, university education. And naturally, there were a lot of um, mathy problems that need to be solved. You know, the kind that are in the um, end of every chapter in the textbook or uh, the one that your professor hands out to you as um, um, at the end of each week. And um, in the beginning of my studies, I started uh, tackling these kind of problems with pen and paper in a classical way. Um, but uh, as I got more and more familiar with programming languages, I started writing little programs um, to, to solve these problems, maybe to, um, to, to prove, to, to un understand some part of the proof or to implement some little algorithm from the textbook. And I found that programming in this way was a good companion through my, my study time. And um, because it like kind of allowed me to, um, to explore programming with the help of math and math with the help of programming. So it was getting the best of both worlds. Fast forward a little bit. Um, a couple of years later, I graduated and I found myself in the industry. So, in, so right now I'm in a quite large IT project and we are using conventional languages like Java and JavaScript. And what I do in my everyday work is pretty far from these mathy problems that I used to spend my time solving in university. Um, and of course, I quickly realized that programming in university is different from programming in the real world. So to say, um, mainly, it's not only about you and the problem anymore, but about a whole group of different stakeholders that all have different visions about um, the business domain. And Getting out into the real world for, for a university student can be hard. Um, there's a lot of deadlines, a lot of people telling you what to do. And even seasoned programmers often discuss this, um, our industry, our programming industry that we are working in in kind of a, a mocking, but uh, mocking way, um, but uh, often humoristically as well. And one of these discussions is in this uh, classical our infamous blog post, I should say, called Programming Sucks by Peter Hunt Welsh. And I, if you don't mind, I'll just read uh, a paragraph from this um, blog post because it helps put this talk into perspective. Every programmer occasionally, when nobody's home, turns off the lights, pours a glass of scotch, puts on some light German electronica and opens up a file on their computer. It's a different file for every programmer. Sometimes they wrote it, sometimes they found it, and they knew they had to save it. They read over the lines and they weep at their beauty. Then the tears turn bitter as they remember the rest of the files and the inevitable collapse of all that is good and true in this world. This file is good code. It has sensible and consistent names for functions and variables. It's concise. It doesn't do anything obviously stupid. It never had to live in the wild or answer to a sales team. It does exactly one mundane specific thing and he does it well. It was written by a single person and never touched by another. Every programmer starts out writing a perfect little snowflake like this. Then they're told on Friday you need to have 600 snowflakes written by Tuesday. So they cheat a bit here and there, and maybe a copy a few snowflakes and try to stick them together, or they have to ask a coworker to work on one who melts it, and then all the programmer snowflakes get done together in some inscrutable shape, and so on and so forth. This snowflake is going to be kind of the, the role model for this talk. Um, 
for me, my little snowflakes were little programs I used to write in Haskell in university to solve specific math problems. Because really what a program is, is a solution to a very specific problem. And I used to spend like evenings optimizing, tweaking them like this um, um, because I had the time to do so. And a question I want to start with is like, what can we learn from the snowflake? Well, obviously uh, they're good, but what's so good about these, these snowflakes? And we have seen time and time again, it has been discussed that um, what, once you get into, on, uh, once you get to the industry, the real world, um, these kind of nice little programs, um, they don't seem to, to scale that well. But this talk is not going to be about industrial programming. It's going to be more about could they scale in theory? Because if they can scale in theory, then maybe in the future, we could have more uh, scalable uh, snowflakes actually that we're actually using in production. So in order to ask these kind of broad questions, we need to start with the fundamentals. So what I want to do first is I want to describe some kind of mental framework around problem solving. Well, I want to uh, ask the question, why do we solve problems and how do we solve problems? Then I want to define what a category means in order to have some kind of um, have some kind of way to, to talk about this mental framework. So if you're interested in category theory, um, I'm going to give you the basics in this talk. And the interesting part is that we are going to use category theory to, to have some concepts between the world of math and programming. And we're going to use functors um, in order to kind of transcend the world between mathematics and programming. So let's first talk about problem solving. In this tweet, one programmer uh, wrote some, some code and the second programmer sees this code and becomes upset. And it's understandable because he, uh, that he got upset because this code that was written, it takes something that is simple, like uh, logic, and it makes it into something more um, difficult by, by adding an indirection that is argu arguably completely useless. So Nick becomes upset when he sees this code, and, and uh, we all kind of do, because we reason about code because we want to write good programs, and we don't want to think twice about them. We want the code that we read to kind of just um, the information that we see just flow to us and we don't want to think twice. Coming back to the snowflake, we just read, I just read to you out loud that the snowflake has sensible consistent names, it is concise, it does exactly what it's supposed to do and it doesn't do anything stupid. I think these first two bullet points, uh, for me at least, it means that it is code or it is a program that is understandable. Um, and the second two points also have something to do with understandability, but they are really this common sense. And the bullet points from the previous slide um, are often talked about when you're talking about elegant code. So elegant code and understandable code usually um, has, has something in common. Um, but to make it a bit more structured, uh, we want to talk about understandable code, like code that is broken up into just big enough chunks for our brain to process. Because as we know, we can only keep a um, limited amount of things in mind at the same time. And um, and so what we do when we solve, when we have any kind of non-trivial problem is that we divide it into sub-problems. We solve those sub-problems independently. Then we, um, then we recurse and then we compose everything back together again. This is what we learn um, like our first day of 
any kind of computer science related class. Um, and it's what is called divide and conquer. And it's in fact the only, only way we humans, the only strategy we humans um, know of when it comes to solving problems at all. In practice, a problem that has been divided can look like this. This is a procedural program. Um, and it is, the problem is read a string from uh, standard input, calculate if its length is even, and then print that to the console. So in this C++ program, we, what we did in order to solve this problem is we split it up into sub procedures like get line, length, uh, module equals and so on. And then we somehow compose them together again. And that is the solution to the problem. And the point here is that even if you have a procedural program like this that can uh, do side effects and, and uh, write to global variables and whatnot, it's still a matter of taking the output of some sub problem, pass it, passing that into the input of some other sub problem, and then composing them to get back together again. This gets even more clear if we write this program in a language like Haskell, where composition is really the, uh, in focus. So the same pro pro program here, we write as a composition between the functions show, even, and length. And then we use a special interact function to make sure that we can print and uh, print to, to, to standard out and read from standard in. And if you, we add some type annotations for our helper functions here, we can see the structure even more clear. We can see the data flowing through our application. First it is a string, then it becomes an int, then it becomes a bool, and then it becomes a string again. So we can see the structure, we can see the structure that is defined by how we chose to compose this particular problem. So the point is, if you, it doesn't matter if you call it procedures or functions, they're just another way of describing a, a smaller problem. And programming is about composing these things. And the choice that you have is how you split and how you compose. And that's how you yield structure. And to study structures, we have seen the Haskell prog program were easier to see the structure than the C, um, the C++ program. So it helps us to use functional programming languages, uh, especially uh, strongly types, where you can also see the types. Um, and so what I really want to take away from this section is that structure is really composition. And if we're in the world of programming, we're talking about program structure is function composition. Now we will see how we can actually study composition. Um, and this is where category theory comes in. Uh, so as programmers, we like patterns, right? It doesn't matter if we are object-oriented programmers or functional programmers, we like patterns because we want to take one pattern, we want to see a pattern and we want to apply it um, in different places so we don't have to write code all the time. Uh, this book, Design Patterns, it has um, maybe 10 or, or 20 patterns, something like that. Um, very practical patterns that you can use in the real world. But if you contrast that to um, a categorical cat category theory stand standpoint for um, discussing patterns, it's like category theory is like the, the science of patterns. If you think about patterns as a, uh, if you think about programming as, as a big search space of patterns, then category theory is um, 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 one lets us discover this search space and like, talk about patterns in a in a in a formal way. So as you may know, category theory started out by some very advanced mathematicians working in advanced mathematical fields, discovering some structure in these different fields, and uh, they thought, why don't why don't we abstract? So they, they created this new mathematical branch called category theory, whose original purpose was to abstract and, and reuse structure from different fields. And, and because it started out so, um, uh, so um, in such a, a very formal mathematical manner, it's interesting that it applies very well to, to programming. And um, 
and it does it does so just because as programmers we don't want to do this we don't want to talk about the details of things we want to talk about data flowing and the, the structure through our application and so programming is all about structure of our problems of our human problems not about the, the uh, computer um, and as we have seen structure is composition category theory study of composition so that's why category theory has gotten a lot of buzz in programming let's see how we define a category a category consists of two things. The first is, is objects, and second, we have arrows, and we draw and we depict it like this. So we, we put labels on the, 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 ob, the objects and the arrows. It doesn't really matter what these, what these labels are a lot of the time. Um, so for in this case, we have objects A, B, and C, and the arrows F and G. And the first property of a, of a category is that is the property of composition. So if you have two arrows, like in this case, with a common end and start point, there has to exist a third arrow that is the composition of these, um, these two arrows. So we call this compositional arrow G after F because G comes after F. The second property of a category is a property of uh, associativity. So um, we have that if we have a chain of arrows like this, we have, um, it shouldn't matter if we take first the arrow F and then we take the arrow H after G, or we take the arrow G after F and then we take H, or we take F after G after H. It should, when I say it shouldn't matter, I mean that for whatever meaning we assign to this category, um, it shouldn't change the meaning whatever way you take. So that's associativity. And then the third property is the property of identity, which means that, um, so first and foremost, every object, I didn't, I didn't draw them out earlier, but every object, object has an identity arrow uh, called ID of that object, and it serves like a unit, meaning that just like, a, just like the, the number zero is a unit in addition, this ID arrow is the unit of category theory. Um, so, which it means that if you take first, if you take any of those arrows and then any other arrow, it has the same meaning as just taking the other arrow. So in this case, ID A composed with F is the same thing as F, and F composed with ID B is the same thing as F as well. And that's it. Um, yes, um, so, and then you're asking, like, what, what, can I, what can I even do with this? Why, how does this make sense? The first thing to notice is a very simple uh, definition, but what you, but category theory is a whole field of mathematics, and you can use use these these very simple rules to derive a surprising amount of properties that can apply to different concept okay, to different contexts. So, for example, uh, in programming, but a category is not about programming, and it's really up to us to give a category some meaning. And then if we have, um, and then the idea is that we have uh, meaning for different categories and we can compare and reuse those structures across different, these different contexts. And the question is then how do we define meaning for a particular category? Well, we have to say four things. First, we have to say what the objects are, then we have to say what the arrows are, we have to say what the identities are, and we have to say how the arrows compose. Um, so I'll do this now for an example category. We're also commonly known as a monoid, but I'll just call this category M. And I'll say that uh, the objects in my category M are the single object X. The arrows are the natural numbers, meaning I have uh, in this category an infinite amount of, of arrows labeled from zero to infinity, just um, just returning to the same object. I say that the identity arrow is the arrow named zero. Um, and I say that composition means plus. And now I have given this some meaning. Let's see if the, if, if <clears throat> the, the category, if, if the, the, the properties of the cat category 
um, checks out with the property of how we usually talk about addition of natural numbers. So composition. For any two arrows that you travel in this category, there should be a composite arrow n plus m that does the same thing. And trivially, this is true because you always return to the same object. Identity, any arrow, um, you take first any arrow n and then you take zero. It has the same meaning as um, just taking that arrow n. And associativity, it doesn't matter if you first travel i plus j, uh, if you first travel arrows i and then j and then k, or if you travel i and then j and then k, it has to say it, it, um, it trivially all of these properties check out. So that's how you can define some meaning to a category and how you can check if that checks out. But, um, and the point here really is that, that the composition defines the logic of, um, of this, this category. And this should be true even if you have more complex categories that have more than only one object. Um, it still might not be clear why this is even useful. So let's go into a bit more familiar ground for many, probably. So let's talk about our category, the programmers category. This category is called the category of types and functions, and we define it like this. We say that the objects in this category are types, so like string, int, whatever types you have in your programming language. Arrows are functions. Uh, identity is a special function that takes one argument and returns it without doing anything to it. And composition is function composition, however you compose function in your programming language. We can draw out this uh, special programmers category um, here I would just draw on a, a, a subset of the types like string, int, and bool, because uh, obviously we, if, if we wanted to draw this, this entire category, we would have to draw out all the possible type and all the possible functions that could ever exist between these types. But here we have made things simpler, just draw a part of it. So we have for the example functions length, even, and because we have those two functions, we know by the property of composition that there has to exist a function uh, called even after length, which in our category is just by composing even and length. And now the, the fun thing starts. So let's imagine that we shrink this, this down into a single object. So all types and all functions that you can ever think of, we abstract over all that and say that this thing is a single object in like a new super category called cat. I didn't come up with the name cat. It's actually a, a thing in category theory. It's the category of where, um, where the objects are categories themselves and the arrows between these objects are called functors. So the German seems to be really afraid of functors for some reason um, and they keep, always keep their distance to them. I don't really understand why, because I come from Sweden. I will explain to you why functors are not that difficult. So a functor, if you think about this, this category cat, where these arrows between categories, a functor is a mapping between categories. What does that even mean? You think about sets from mathematics, like ordinary sets that are bags of elements. You probably know that a, a function in the mathematical sense is just a mapping that uh, between elements from of these two sets with some constraints to it. Um, a functor maps objects into objects so between two categories. You have objects in one category and objects in another category. A functor is like a, a mapping between those and by doing so, you implicitly also map arrows into arrows. Um, and there's, there's, mo there's more uh, constraints to a functor than a function in that the functor has to preserve structure. I try to explain what I mean now without showing you any, any uh, formulas. So here we have two categories, two different categories that I, I just made these up. The first, the green category is the category of web pages and hyperlinks. 
And the second category is a category where objects are servers and the arrows are some kind of um, connections between the servers. One possible way of defining a functor that maps these two categories together would be like this. So the red arrows now represent a functor. And um, some kind of meaning here would be that server A hosts all the .com domain and server B hosts all the domain. And you can see that there is a arrow between uh, foo and bar in the green category. So there should also be an arrow between the object that it, it, it mapped, these two objects were mapped into in the second category. And we can see that that checks out. And we can take another arrow, we can check, we can see that it's possible to take a link to go from bar.com to bass.de, and there should be a an, an corresponding arrow in the, se in the second category, uh, which means which would mean that maybe you have to, to, uh, to switch server or something. Um, and also, if you uh, take any composition of any two arrows in the, in the source category, then there should also be a possible to compose those arrows in the target category. So this is a valid functor because it doesn't break the uh, structure of composition in our original category. This, on the other hand, is an invalid functor because it tears up the structure in that it maps bass into A and bar into B, and there is no arrow between, um, there's no corresponding arrow um, in, this, in the target category for this. So this is an invalid functor. Now let's introduce endo functors. So if you remember cat, this category of where, where um, objects themselves are categories and uh, arrows are functors, there's nothing that says that we cannot have an arrow that goes back to the same object. So we say that this, this top right uh, object here is the category of types and functions. Then we can have an endo functor that is a, an arrow looping back to the same thing. So what this really means is that uh, arrows between the same objects in CAT is an endo functor. And this is the only kind of function we actually use in programming. We, in programming, we don't care about other categories than, um, than the, the category of types and functions. The only thing we do is we map this category of type and function onto itself in order. So, so what you, we can say is we map different parts of this category onto itself. Um, can look like this. So we have a, um, on the bottom, we have some types like string, int, and bool. And in program, when we, when we think about mapping, we usually think about mapping over some type. So, and this actually, uh, um, uh, what, what we would do also in a categorical sense, when we define the function map um, over something, we would, uh, th there would be a functor mapping some structure, some, some in the bottom, some structure in the bottom into some similar structure in another part of the category. So we have the, the part that, that deals with lists and you have the part that deals with, with only uh, plain types. And, and this mapping would somehow, um, somehow correspond to, to the functor. And let's make this a little bit more abstract. The functor is a mapping between categories, but in programming, we usually use, uh, we usually use it to lift um, simple types into more richer types because simple types always often have simple types and their functions often have um, similar structure when you go when you like increase the complexity of a type like int to list of int and the functor does this by preserving the structure so if you have like a program like a little snowflake that you have composed with pure functions you don't have to worry that the function functor will mess up your composition. And this is really the important part. Um, so let's see how we can describe a functor. So in Haskell um, and other many other programming languages, we have higher um, higher order types, it's called. So uh, which means that we can have a function as an input to another function. So what we can do is well, um, to pass 
to, to describe this mapping of taking this arrow and turning it into this arrow in the other part of the category, we, what we can do is we uh, define a function called fmap, which, take, which takes this particular function as an argument and returns um, this enriched function in another part of the category as a return type. Um, the interface looks like this in Haskell. So <clears throat> we have the function called fmap, and this is the fun and the function it takes a function from any type A to B as an input and it returns a function of some type f of A to f of B. And the f here, f here is described by the function, the functor. It is a type constructor and it says, give me an A, give me a B, I will give you some, uh, I will give you some f of A, f of B, which is another type. So a functor represents different parts of um, different categories. And in programming, you can say that it represents a new computational context. We, um, and both of these things are true, but the important part is that it retains the structure of the original mapping in terms of composition. So if you look at some example context, we have the context of list uh, that we have already seen. And this is the context where you can have pure programs, but they might return multiple values. Or you have the context of maybe, which is uh, the same thing, but you can have failures in your programs. Or you can have uh, the context of IO, where you can also have pure programs, but side effects might happen. These are different contexts, and we can use a functor to abstract over these contexts. So this is some examples from the prompt. I'll show you a very trivially, trivial example of this. So we have our little program. We have length, we have even, we have even composed with length. We have some kind of structure and we just take this and using fmap to put it into a different context. So in the context of list, um, for example, even composed with length, does the thing we expect, but it, it, um, but it does it in the context that it is applied to. Uh, we don't change the structure of the, the composition. The same thing, we have the same structure in the, in the new context this time, it is uh, the context of maybe. Um, we, we apply it to, uh, we apply it and we get what we expect. And the same, same idea in, in the context of IO where we can get side effect for string from the user, for example, we have still the same prob program as before um, uh, but only in a new context. So when we, we, we use a functor is one way of exposing structure um, in one part of a category to another. Um, and I, I just talked about three of the, of, of the types that, that can behave like a functor right now, the first three in this list, but this list goes on and, and the cool thing about languages like Haskell is that everyone, if, if you're using an abstraction like this, everyone knows uh, what you're talking about. So you seldom have to come up with uh, these kind of abstractions on your own. Um, so a function functor pr provides to us um, consistent, predictable structural sharing, which it, which sounds very nice for us as programmers, but um, but um, um, but it's seldom that we have some some kind of uh, consistent way of applying that. Um, we have instant content switching, context switching. So if you have one a program like um, a pure nice program that we wrote, and we want to 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 execute it in some different context, we can use a functor to do that just by applying it with fmap. And we do things, follows flexibility, code reuse, separation of concerns, all these nice things that we ever wanted um, if we use this correctly. Um, so coming back to the snowflake, um, really what, um, what, what I want to get at here is that using a functor 
for example, we can take these little snowflakes and and uh, put them in a different context without risking that they turn into spaghetti. Um, so for me, thinking categorically has helped me to explore math programming and math and programming side by side, which is really cool. Um, it has helped me become more curious about writing programs, like what do the programs even mean that I write? And um, it has made me realize um, their structure in a more in a more structured way let's say um, and and it has made me more confident on knowing uh, when I can take some structure and and uh, put it into some different context so and as we know the functor is just the beginning uh, there are many many type classes um, that build on functor. Um, the, the next step is usually applicative, which is a special kind of functor. <clears throat> but I think for um, 30, 40 minutes, uh, just talking about the functor itself is more, more than enough. Um, but there's a whole, but once you, you start thinking about this thing, there's a whole, whole world um, that, that opens up. So in summary, fundamentally, as humans, the only way we can solve problems is by splitting, solving, and composing recursively. Um, and it's this choice that we have, it's like the only choice we have, when do we split and when do we compose? And um, functional pro we use functional programming because it makes this essential, this very, this very fundamental process as explicit as possible. Um, Category theory helps us formally reason about this structure um, and um, provides concepts like function, functor that lets us put perfect little snowflakes into more complicated contexts without having to think twice. So then I'm done and I will try to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we already got two questions. Um, uh, Jacek um, says he, he strongly disagrees with your statement that programs are all about structure and for him programs are all about behavior because what matters to his customers is what the program does, not how it's structured. And I think it's a kind of two-part question and he wants to know how do function, functors, functions and categories help us to write better software? Um, so uh, this is um, a common common question that you that you get, and it's um, it's kind of hard to answer because it is um, um, because it kind of assumes that um, because because what I'm talking about is the the structure of actually of, uh, of solving problems, which um, which is some kind of inherent um, procedure that that we that we humans um, figure out in order to to uh, define logic, and um, uh, it's a question that I that I think about a lot, but um, uh, I have not. I, it's a very broad question, and it's also a, a it also leaves a lot of things open. Like what, um, how does it, how does, uh, how does, um, what is really programming? I, I think that uh, actually everyone has to to um, have some um, some uh, uh, definition of what programming means for them, and and. Uh, if this is a, if this, uh, and, and I shared with you my my view of uh, programming. Of course, it doesn't. Um, it is a very abstract take on um, um, on on this whole uh, this whole thing that we are that we are doing in order to solve problems, and you can interpret it in different ways. And um, this is just my way of um, interpreting 
some of the ideas that we get from math, uh, some uh, mathematics and how we can apply them to, to programming. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for to, to this question, but uh, right now, but um, I'll be happy to discuss it uh, on on uh, on any medium that you can reach out. Okay, it isn't one aspect of this also um, to make uh, software more uh, maintainable? Yeah, so that's that was what I, I was getting at. So like, um, um, this is one way where that you can be sure to um, to to apply um, to to be sure that that whatever changes you make does not break. Uh, other parts of the program. So this, like, um, this is the, um, um, this is like the, the uh, usual concern um, in programming that you that you don't want to uh, that you are afraid of doing changes uh, because you don't know what it, what part of, of it might it might affect. But if we know that um, if we know that the structure of the program. Is, is retained when we do such changes. We at least, we know that the only thing that can change is the, the context that we are bringing into, that we are like adding to, um, or the context or the behavior, or that we are adding to um, as a change to our program. And we don't, um, we, will, we won't affect those, um, those uh, those pure parts that we that we know already are, are working. So so that's that's a benefit a customer would get right. So that I I not only get a program that does something I want right now, but cost efficiency and maintainability in the long term. Yeah. Um, Leonard uh, wants to know if there is a way to apply the insights from category theory in a normal Java project. Uh, in Haskell, these concepts are first-class citizens, but in Java, they are not. Um, yeah, I mean, you you can uh, you can uh, simulate uh, you can simulate these concepts in uh, any programming language. It's just that um, just like the the if you're using a language like Java, it makes it really difficult uh, because you you have to come up with. Uh, I maybe answer this question different. There's a, a book called Program um, Category Theory for Programmers, and by Bartos Milewski. And in this book, he uh, talks about category theory side by side with both Haskell and C++. And um, he shows that there it's possible to, to um, implement some of these concepts in uh, C++ using template metaprogramming. I'm not that uh, familiar with all the feature, different features of Java that would make this um, uh, how easy it would be, but um, um, in theory, everything is possible. Okay, um, this is all um, the questions we had. Um, so, oh, that comes a question. Uh, okay, that's that's just a, a, a comment. Sorry. So, um, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you very much uh, for your talk. If if you enjoyed Ludwig's talk, um, please give us a thumbs up. If you want to get notified. Uh, about future episodes of this podcast, um, not podcast, about this uh, this this, uh, this streaming format, please um, subscribe and um, click the bell to get notified. Um, most of our episodes are in German. We uh, but we always have we have frequently um, English uh, English episodes as well. So thank you very much and have a good day.